Hey Kaikilan. Uh, greetings everyone. Uh, we are very happy to participate with you, at least uh, digitally. I uh, wish you very, very best for a very important conference that you're having there. Uh, I've been asked to give some kind of introduction to what we think nonviolence is and how it uh, fits into the solution of global problems. Uh, there's a story going around that you probably have heard. I think it's probably uh, an apocryphal story, probably didn't happen, but that doesn't matter. About a Native American grandfather who says to his grandson, Son, I feel that I have two wolves inside of me. One of them is a very tame beast, and the other is really a savage animal, and they're fighting it out inside me. And the grandson says, For heaven's sake, grandfather, which one of them is going to win? And the grandfather says, the one that I feed. Now, unfortunately, this is uh, very characteristic, very true of human nature. We have very destructive impulses inside of us, and we have very constructive impulses in inside of us. I was at a conference recently about science and nonviolence and science and peace, and they were trying to decide whether we are wired for compassion or wired for uh, violence and uh, I said and I think we came to the conclusion that as human beings we are wired for choice there isn't anything in our evolutionary inheritance that tells us that we have to be violent or that automatically guarantees that we'll be peaceful but unfortunately we seem to be living at a time when our culture globally is feeding the wrong wolf we are as a colleague of mine said here's the right wolf right here as a, come here, come here, fancy. As a, <laughs> we all want to be a little bit more like this one here. Okay, thank you. Go down. Go down, duck. Uh, as a colleague of mine recently said at the University of California, we are increasing violence by every means possible. We are ignoring the suggestibility of the human being. It's only a couple of days now after a terrible shooting massacre took place in the United States, in Colorado. And uh, at last, people are beginning to recognize that these things happen regularly, and they're starting to ask what's wrong with us. But so far, I've heard very few people come up with the answer. There's nothing wrong with us. What's wrong is the cultural environment in which we find ourselves, where every single problem has to be solved by violence. In fact, Every single problem that's really facing the world today, the environmental ones, the economic ones, of course the conflict ones, the humanity acting out in a large scale known as war, all of those problems could be called symptoms of violence. And the solution to every single one of them lies in the development of nonviolence. So the absolutely essential question for us as individuals and as the human race today is, what is nonviolence? How can we develop it? And how can we apply it on the global scale? So let me say something about all three of those. Uh, in a uh, really useful book by Chris Hedges called War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, he came to the conclusion that love is the only thing that could have enough power and be opposite enough to overcome the war system that we're currently suffering from. But he said, love cannot be organized. Well, uh, I know what he means, but in a way I would disagree with Chris. I think love can be organized. And when it's organized, what you get is known as nonviolent resistance. At this time, there's been a very uh, useful study by two scholars connected with the International Center for Nonviolent Conflict, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. And they have studied 300-odd transitions to democracy that have taken place around the world, uh, I think in about the last 80 years or so. Of those, about 60% have been, well, no, some of those have been resolved through nonviolence and some through violence. The nonviolent ones have been exactly twice as successful, about 66% of the time. 
The violent ones have been successful only about 29% of the time. The nonviolent ones tended, this is really a surprise, this surprised even me, and I'm trying to be a, an expert in this field. The nonviolent ones were twice as fast. They took two and a half to three years to reach resolution, while the violent ones took uh, six to 12 to nine years to reach resolution. So there obviously is a powerful force that could be organized. It is self-organizing to some degree. And we think that if we learn more about it, learn where it comes from, and organize it more consciously, it would be unstoppable. And within perhaps our own lifetime, maybe not mine, but some of my younger friends, we could see the reversal of every single one of these problems, the environmental, economic, conflict-oriented, and so forth. So what is it and how to organize it? Well, you can see nonviolence operating sometimes on a very small scale among people who are not world famous and not good organizers. There was an episode in our part of the country recently where an older woman who was somewhat disabled was getting into her car in a shopping center and a young man jumped into the car, pulled a gun on her and said, give me all your money. And instead of either complying, like here's all my money, or, or non-complying, saying get the heck out of here, she spoke to him very calmly and she said, young man, Jesus is with me in this car. She said, if you shoot me, I'm going straight to heaven, and you're going straight to hell. And then they launched into a conversation at the end of which this young man was crying profusely, which is not at all uncommon, incidentally, in people who have been confronted by a nonviolent response and had their, had their violent impulses challenged by something nobler. He was crying, and as he went to leave the car, she handed him all of her money, which at that time was about uh, $10. So I think without her knowing it, she was actually acting out some of the basic principles of nonviolence, namely not to respond to anger and fear, not to, be, not to follow orders which are being given to you in a threatening way, not hating the person. This is key. I'm not going along with what you're doing, but I'm not hating you as a human being. In fact, I believe that we can reach a win-win solution where both of us will have our basic needs met. And being perfectly willing to help him when it was not under compulsion. So this was really good nonviolence principles in a person who had never taken my course, never read my book, which Timo will show you a copy of, uh, by way of saying that we have the right wolf inside of us. What we need to do is be able to identify it and feed it. So to identify it, I think Chris Hedges had uh, the right instinct. Nonviolence uh, as a social force has really been called love in action. Just as violence arises from the instinct for self-preservation and triggers in us and in the people that we deal with, emotions like hate and anger, hate and fear, nonviolence arises from an entirely different instinct. It arises actually from the instinct for self-sacrifice in a higher cause. Don't get the wrong idea. It doesn't mean that you rush in and lay your life down just for the glory of it or because you're supposed to do it, but there's a tremendous power that comes from the willingness to lay down your life rather than to inflict suffering on others. You may remember that climactic line in Attenborough's film, Gandhi, which I'm not sure Gandhi ever said, but it was perfectly characteristic when he said, this too is a cause in which I am prepared to die, but my friends, there is no cause in which I am prepared to kill. This reversal brings about a tremendous confer conversion of negative energies that are inside the person. Uh, both Gandhi and King bore witness to this on a large scale. Gandhi said, I have learned the one supreme lesson to conserve my anger. And just as steam, when conserved, can be a force to drive an engine, 
anger conserved can be a force to change the world. I think what was going on in Gandhi's vision was two things. The recognition that as human beings, we don't just live on the surface of life. We're not just physical machines. We're not just intellectual calculators. Consciousness is very deep. To use a traditional model, we have body, mind, and spirit. Spirit is something we can hardly even reach under normal circumstances, but it has tremendous power. Under extraordinary circumstances, people have done incredible things to mobilize this power, which has a, a tremendously converting effect on those confronting them. Uh, in my book, I mentioned one example that took place during the civil rights movement in Birmingham, Alabama, which is a remarkable example because it happened to ordinary people and it happened to them en masse. It was a group demonstration. They were marching down to the courthouse. Suddenly they were blocked by police and firemen. There was a very, very, um, very committed segregationist police commissioner a f infamous character by the name of Bull Connor. And uh, the marchers didn't know what to do. They, they just knelt down on the sidewalk to pray. While they were praying, they became, in the words of one of the participants, they became spiritually intoxicated. The whole group of people just got up and walked right into those police and firemen. And of course, Bull Connor uh, uh, quite characteristically said, turn on the hoses. You know, those tremendously powerful fire hoses that they used to use to blow demonstrators away. Well, an amazing thing happened. None of the firemen had the will, the psychological capacity to turn on those hoses. They stood there with their hands on the handle, frozen. The marchers walked through them, noticing that a number of them were crying again. And uh, as they walked through them, they just said, how do you feel about what you're doing? You know, we are here to get our freedom and we are not going back. So this was a remarkable episode of spiritual energies that were harnessed. And part of the clue, as I'm trying to emphasize here, is that here are people who must have been feeling a lot of fear and anger. But when they decided not to act out that fear or anger, we're not running away, we're not throwing bottles at the cops. We're not cursing at them. We're just in a dignified, determined manner going to do what we believe is right. And when you don't act out on those negative separating emotions, a remarkable thing happens. They get converted into a positive, creative force. And Martin Luther King, looking at episodes like this, he said, we did not cause outbursts of anger as we've been accused of doing. What we did was harness anger under discipline for maximum effect. Just, just savor that phrase a little bit. Harbor, harness anger under discipline for maximum effect. The discipline is the emotional work of not responding to the fear and anger that's coming up inside of you. And that uh, the maximum effect is because when you change over anger and fear into a constructive, creative force, it triggers the same kind of force in the other person. Now, we folks in the nonviolence world have been saying this for years and years, but there's actually now some scientific evidence for it. And one of the really uh, intriguing and uh, makes me very optimistic uh, changes that are going on in the world today is really inspiring, is that science is starting to shed wonderful light on how nonviolence works. And they say that inside the human brain and the central nervous system, there are neurons. They call them mirror neurons, although some people call them Gandhi neurons, which uh, are like tuning forks. They pick up the spiritual state, the emotional state, the activities, the acts of another person. So that, let's say, you are threatening me. Now, no one at this conference is going to threaten me, but just, you know, for purposes of argument, you're threatening me. The, you're offering me a vision of separateness, which resonates with the emotions of anger and fear. And what I'm doing is 
I'm saying no thank you to those emotions and offering instead to you in return a world of unity, a world that stems from a deeper vision of human interconnectedness to which you cannot but respond. That's the point. Now, you may not respond immediately the way I want you to. You may even carry out your act of your threat of violence, but you have been moved. So if we ask ourselves what is nonviolence, it's a force that's released into the human environment by the conversion of a negative separating drive like fear or anger. Okay, well and good. Well, now, how do we use it? Um, First of all, we can follow certain practices that enable us to do that conversion more automatically. As I've mentioned before, we live in a, in a culture which is not going to encourage us to carry out these conversions. Once when I was talking about my book on the radio, some guy got on and said, if someone cuts me off and I don't pull a, my nine millimeter out of my glove compartment and shoot him, what kind of a man am I? Well, I would say you're a real man if you don't do that. But in other words, we are being exposed to between three and 5,000 commercial messages every day. Every one of those messages is saying you are a separate material object in competition with others for scarce resources. And uh, it's all a humongous lie. And in order to protect ourselves from this really damaging wrong image, of who we are, what the world is. What we've recommended is that people try to avoid exposing themselves to the mass media on the one hand, and on the other hand, to learn everything you can about nonviolence. It's a big field. We have a huge library in here in the Meta Center. It's not just a question of being a nice guy, withholding your impulse to strike somebody, it's a science which Gandhi practiced for almost 50 years. And uh, he worked it out in great detail and he left behind 98 volumes of his collected works. Of course, we have a lot of information also for you on our website, metacenter.org. Uh, so what you'll be doing is starving the wrong wolf, represented by the mass media, and feeding the right wolf, which is acquiring cognitive information, knowledge about nonviolence, which is inspiring us, giving us a feeling of human interconnectedness the whole time. We also recommend, uh, we recommend taking up some kind of spiritual practice because the change that we want to invoke has to come from a really deep level. And we recommend interacting with other people in a really personal way. Uh, every time you have a chance, go and talk to somebody instead of calling them on the phone. Call them on the phone instead of emailing them, and so on and so forth. To feel ourselves one with our human beings is tremendously helpful. Uh, many experiments have shown that families that have stopped watching television, an interesting thing happens. They start quarreling a lot. Why? because all of this problem that they had with one another has been suppressed for a long time. So when they stop watching television, they're suddenly facing each other, so they start fighting. But after that, they work it out, and they're reconnected at a much deeper level than they were before when all of that conflict was just suppressed by the triviality of the mass media. So uh, if you have a spiritual practice, if you're not exposing yourself to the mass media too much, and if you're learning about nonviolence, you will be in a really strong position to go out and interact with other people in a way which will be fulfilling and rewarding for yourself and very helpful for them. And you'll be setting the stage for a nonviolent world. But that world is still not going to happen all by itself. So the next thing that we recommend is that Look around at the problems and the projects that have been engaged to resolve them. Look within and ask yourself, what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? And get engaged, if you have not already done so, with a project that could be helpful in solving some of the problems in our world. We are going to offer to you a project that we call Roadmap, which will then uh, I think give us some guidelines on how to 
take this person power that we're developing, use it in constructive action, and then go on to nonviolent resistance when we have to. So uh, I hope you find these remarks of interest. We are very uh, jealous that you're all there together. Uh, and we, uh, we feel very much with you in solidarity. We look forward very much to hearing the results of your conference. Thank you.